that they gave me. Um, my name is Greg Hoagland. Uh, good afternoon. This is like the last talk, so I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. I, I put 50 slides or so in here, and my experience has been that uh, that might take me maybe an hour and a half. I think I got an hour and 15 minutes, so I'm going to have to try to speed through some of the parts. Um, the talk I'm going to give here is a new one. I have never given it before, so it's new material for me. But uh, the first part of the talk is kind of me ranting about bad software and some of the reasons why I think um, software uh, is very poorly written today, and, some, and then later on in the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the things uh, that we can do to fix that. Uh, most notably, software fault injection. Uh, for the last two years or so, I've been pretty much in the weeds trying to solve software security problems using a fault injection technology. Um, it's a new kind of quality assurance testing that's typically not done uh, inside of software vendors today, but it's really good at finding problems. And in fact, it's one of the primary ways that hackers actually find zero-day exploits, among other methods. So um, to get started, I'm going to kind of talk about bad software. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of, uh, out of not just security, but reliability. Because I think security is a subset of reliability. And I'm going to talk about reliable software. By talking about reliable software, we are by default also talking about security. Um, some of the things that come to mind when I think about bad software is I think about the software out there that will take uh, an SQL tick in the wrong place and disclose all the records of your database. So exp exposing confidential data is something that bad software does. Um, I think about Microsoft SQL Server and the fact that I can grind it to a halt by sending this exactly just correctly formed packet and it completely wedges the protocol parser. So it crashes. That's a type of software fault. That's bad software. Um, obviously, buffer overflows one of the most insidious but effective types of attacks. Um, that's an execution flaw, an architecture flaw in the execution uh, of the code. I mean, that's bad software. And you know, privilege elevation, things like that. Um, bad software is very expensive. It costs people a lot of money. Uh, and so I want to kind of talk about some kind of famous examples of software failures that have cost, uh, caused catastrophic loss, either in terms of, of life or damages. Um, the Denver airport is a famous example. They have, a, they have an automated baggage system that runs on carts. And then the airport itself was delayed for 11 months opening because the baggage system, the software that ran it, failed to detect um, failure, uh, faults within the, the tracking system. That is, a bag falls off a cart, gets in the way of a cart. Um, they can't correctly detect this. Carts run into other carts. Completely full baggage carts are filled again by the loaders. Um, empty carts are unloaded, and this caused an 11-month delay. Now, that doesn't in itself seem like a big deal, but the fact that they were paying a million dollars a day in fines on their bond every single day for the 11 months, that really added up. And that was a software failure that was extremely expensive. This is a ridiculously funny picture that I found on the internet. This is the last photograph taken from the Mars lander moments before it crashed into the surface of the planet. It's kind of cool because it has these little fractal diagrams like ripping over there and stuff. And it's kind of fascinating to me. It's almost like a piece of art, like what software looks like right before it's about to die. <laughs> um, the reason why this Mars lander crashed is because um, there was some bad software in there, some code uh, that was doing bad translation between units. And a numerical calculation went bad. And what it did is it shut off its descent, descent engines prematurely. Now, if you know anything about astrophysics, one of the things you'll note, note is that trying to make the Mars lander land where it's supposed to is like trying to take a BB gun and hit a piece of paper that is turned sideways and pointing at you from across a football field. And so the tiny little failure anywhere, a little perturbation in numbers, can cause a catastrophic failure. So this was a $165 million failure, um, not to mention all the time and energy lost uh, and from the people at NASA that were trying to manage that mission. Um, this is an Osprey aircraft. It's kind of a weird half-read between an airplane and a helicopter. It takes a vertical lift off and then can fly like an airplane. Um, it has a software system on it that manages all the hydraulic systems. And a somewhat famous uh, episode occurred when the hydraulic system failed. The backup system was there, but it failed to come online because of a software glitch, and four Marines lost their lives. So software failures 
when we think about them, we sometimes think about our little problems and our little DMZ, but what we have to realize is that software is permeating every part of our lives. Everything from you know, your shower head to your toaster is gonna have little microprocessors in there. And as that continues, obviously all that's gonna run on some sort of code. And that code's gonna have problems. And maybe malicious people will be getting into the code, maybe by accident it'll be failing to do things properly. Do these two pictures look alike, these two aircraft? Not to us. Um, human beings have really good pattern recognition systems. So what I see on the bottom is an Airbus and a nice smooth front, and on top I see it looks like some, you know, a pretty, pretty mean looking fighter aircraft. To a United States Navy ship and its radar and the software that's running the radar, it couldn't tell the difference between these two. And it shot it down and killed 290 people. You probably remember this was a pretty famous example. This was a software failure. It was also compounded by a human interface problem with the software. And the official statement from the Navy is that it was cryptic and misleading output. That was a catastrophic software failure. Um, another catastrophic software failure that we're all very familiar with is I Love You. Now, I've gotten numerous um, different uh, references to how much it cost, and none of them actually added up to the same number. So I chose this one. This may not be the exact number, but all the, all the estimates were in the billions. $8.5 billion mistake, because someone at Microsoft thought it would be a good idea to just simply execute code that's mailed to you with no authentication whatsoever. Somehow that was supposed to be a feature and not a bug. Well, that was a very expensive feature. Um, there's lots of other examples of bad software that we can talk about, but I'm just trying to make some points and kind of lay the groundwork. Um, now I'd like to talk about some of the reasons, I think, why we've arrived here uh, in the state we are with all the bad software that we have. Um, one of the first things that I, I think is true is that network software traditionally is not designed to withstand a hostile environment. That's changing. I think people who are developing software today are realizing that their, their software is not going to be deployed on a pink fluffy towel in a perfect little room with white walls. No, it's going to be thrown into a deep chasm filled with hostile people kicking and screaming and stabbing at it. And so that's what people need to think of when they build software. That's a mindset shift, and that's one of the reasons why we have bad software today in terms of at least security. Um, another reason is because the development tools that we have have not evolved to the point where they prevent you from making ridiculously stupid errors like buffer overflows using store copy. That's also changing. If you look at Microsoft, they're starting to, to change the way the compiler works to prevent you from making that mistake. New language technologies, obviously not C, but newer language technologies are designed to prevent you from making these silly kinds of mistakes. Another reason why is that QA testing doesn't have a methodology that addresses security problems. Um, and I'll talk more about that. And I think the final and most important reason is, is customers continue to pay for crappy code. You buy it and you eat it and that's the way it is. If you stopped buying products that were written like shit, you'd stop having the problems. Okay, so the problem's getting worse. Uh, this is a trend. Um, in order to compete, obviously software vendors have to give you new services. Uh, we have new kinds of telephones. We have all kinds of new features added to things in our lives. So to do this, um, you're competing with other people. As a vendor, I'm competing with another person out there who's got a new feature, so I gotta add a feature. The market demands that from me. So there's a two-way two street here. Again, I'm giving the features out, but the market's also demanding it. Um, these new features that remain untested. It hasn't been properly tested. This leads a lot to the software failures. Um, there's more connections, devices, and code. I'm gonna kinda talk about some of the um, some of the code. Uh, everybody here has a cell phone, probably. Um, let me think about this for a second. Computers used to be gigantic and you'd walk into them. Today, computers hang on your belt loop. I have a, I have a Kia Sierra smartphone and it has its own file system and it has an embedded operating system and I can get email. So how long is it gonna, and by the way, the operating system on these phones and Palm Pilots and different embedded devices, they aren't compartmented in any way. It's kind of like Windows 95. Any program that gets in there has free and total access to every other program's memory space. So what happens when I get a piece of email with a malformed header, and that header somehow, you know, the parser goes astray and there's a buffer overflow and somebody has some, you know, ARM code or some kind of buffer overflow that fits the device that I'm on, and it spreads, <clears throat> spreads through the cellular phone network in a matter of hours. We're talking millions of devices. It's not a question of if this can happen, it's a question of when it will happen. 
So we have uh, more protocols, obviously that leads to it. The high degree of connectivity makes it sm possible for cascade failures. There are really good historical examples of this um, in power grids and communication systems where one tiny failure in one little piece of the network propagates across the whole board and shuts down all the power across you know, the state. Um, it's happened before, it'll happen again in terms of communication. You probably know that there's a certain number of bugs per thousand lines of code, there's statistics for that. Well, here's some code. Um, some code that I, uh, number of lines of code in some popular systems here that I found. Um, the space station's kind of interesting. It has 40 million lines of code on it. A Boeing 777 has 7 million lines. Um, code's getting obviously more complex as we move forward. I don't know if you've tried to install .NET, but it actually took one of my guys like three or four hours to install it. It's huge. So how many lines of code am I putting on my system in my development environment? How many lines of code am I depending on? In 1983, Microsoft Word was only 27,000 lines of code. So that's just kind of giving you an idea that we're continually increasing in this area. So that's one contributor. The other is exposure. Um, systems that were typically behind closed doors are now completely open, and the threat profile has changed. The internet started with 12 nodes. So machines that have traditionally been behind closed doors are now, like I said, hanging on your belt loop. Um, here's a cool little slide I have. I did some calculations. I did this on my own. Uh, there's, there's uh, I'm going to be kind of conservative here because I actually don't know what the real numbers are going to turn out to be. But on average, there's five to 50 uh, bugs per thousand lines of code. This is something that's pretty well understood and established. So I'm going to say um, there's five bugs per thousand lines of code. I'm just going to use the smallest number. What I did is I calculated the average number of executables on a system, a Windows system in this case, and I was counting DLLs. And then I extrapolated this to, to a, th a 30,000 node network. The idea here is I want to tell you how many backdoors are in, in a typical enterprise network today. So for 3,000 executables, I did some co compilations with C code and found that a, a typical line of C code uh, usually equates to about 10 bytes of actual op code. So there's about 100K per exe on average on the system I was analyzing. That's 10,000 lines of code per exe, five bugs per thousand lines of code minimum. That means we have 50 bugs per, per executable. Okay. Now we're going to extrapolate that to a 30,000 node network. We have this 150,000 bugs per host times 30,000 hosts, 4.5 billion bugs. There's 4.5 billion software bugs in a 30,000 node network. Now, how many of those are security bugs? Not all of them, obviously. So uh, I don't know if this is too, uh, too big of a number or not. I picked 10%. Maybe 10% of them have some kind of security impl implication. So in the enterprise, there's 500 million security bugs. If only 10% of all the security bugs can actually be exercised by someone outside of the local system, in other words, I'm making the assumption that most of them are local in nature, if only 10% of those can be exercised from remote, there's 5 million remote security bugs in a typical enterprise network that's 30,000 nodes. It's an impossible problem to solve. No one is going to go out and patch 5 million holes. Another contributor to the problem is the bleeding edge stuff. We're talking about the market demands. Windows 2000 shipped with 63,000 known bugs. As long as we continue to demand software that's always on the bleeding edge and has the latest features, this is what's going to happen. I mean, it is a market, and Microsoft can't afford to fix all the bugs. Or otherwise, you'd wait two years and pay 10 times as much for the same software. And so, yes, what you've got to ask yourself, are you helping contribute to the software problem by buying crappy code? And if you can actually say, I'll wait two years for that feature, I'll use a word processor that was state of the art five years ago because it's good enough for me, then you're doing a good thing. If you're not paying for software, I guess it doesn't matter, but if you're buying it for your company, you might want to consider not updating to the latest and greatest. If something were new, a brand new bug comes out, it's reasonable to expect that software vendors won't have time to fix it immediately. But the Morris worm used a buffer overflow. That was 15 years ago. And I posit that 15 years is long enough to wait. Software vendors should be expected to release code that has no buffer overflows. None. Zero. Not even one or two. I'll go back to that. In a typical software shop, people gather around and they have their bug list in front of them and they say, we're going to defer this, we'll defer that, we'll patch this in the next release, we're going to completely ignore that, though that one's important enough that we need to fix it because we have a big customer who knows it's there. All right, that happens all the time in a software shop. In other industries, if you have a safety critical bug in one of your, in one of your things that you're selling and it gets out that you knew about it and you let it go out, they can get sued. Not in software. So there's no incentive from that angle. They can afford not to fix their bugs. 
Hardware vendors, on the other hand, they really care about it. Now, Intel's a good example. They'll spend millions of dollars testing their microchips using fault injection and other techniques. And the reason why is if they get it wrong, they have to recall the chip. Maybe that's less so now because they have flashable firmware into the chip, but in the old days, that's how it worked. So here's an example. The Pentium Foof Bug, half a billion dollars is what it costs them to recall it. No, they can't afford to ship stuff out the front door that's broken. They have to do their best because it's going to hurt them a lot. Microsoft, on the other hand, Code Red, how many billions of dollars do you think that costs in damages? They just put a patch on their website, pass the cost of the bug directly onto you, the consumer. Another reason why we have bad software is that the mechanisms for testing software are completely different from, from physical systems. Uh, software is not a steel bridge. Here's an example. I can put a 1,000 kilogram weight test on a girder. I can do a 10,000 kilogram weight test on the girder, and I can make assumptions about five, six, and 7,000 pounds. With software, it's not like that. To do that test, I have to do 1,000, 1,001, 1,002. There's no guarantee. The system is not continuous. The state changes are not gradual or predictable in any way. Here's a number represented in the computer. A computer is, uh, a car is an analog system. I can be driving a car and my brakes fail, the car will coast to a stop. If my car was a digital car and something went wrong, my, my windshield could turn to molten lava, my car could turn inside out, and my wheels could turn to white doves and fly away, just like that. That makes it di it's a different problem to test software. Another one is an attitude problem a lot of developers have, which is let the compiler fix it for me. In the old days, you had to book time on a mainframe and get, you know, maybe two weeks in advance, so you'd spend a lot of time writing out your code perfectly because you didn't want to get it wrong the first time. Today, you can sit there and just slack code all day long at the compiler, and as long as the warnings and errors go away, you've pretty much you've done your job. So much software gets written like that, and it stays that way. Once it passes the compiler test, it gets checked into the source safe server and ends up in the next build, and it's in the production product. Now, people do learn from their mistakes. Um, we're starting finally to see people trying to fix buffer overflows that we've known about for 15 years. Um, form does follow failure. Um, here's a different example in a different engineering field. Um, if you're familiar with power systems, you know that they use AC capacitors to, um, to uh, uh, stabilize the power uh, in the grid. There's this thing called subsynchronous resonance. And what it is is use the, because of some induction in the line, oscillations will get created in the capacitor and they'll travel throughout the whole system. Now, nobody thought that would be a big deal, but actually uh, at this power generating station in uh, southern Nevada, it snapped their shaft on their, on their generator. The oscillations actually fed back through the system, became a physical effect on the generator, and actually snapped the shaft in half. First time it happened, they thought it was a complete fluke. Oh, this is ridiculous. The second time it happened, they realized it was actually a pattern here, and now it's a very serious thing that's considered in every single electrical design that's going out. So hopefully that'll be the case with some of the software stuff. So the second part of my talk is going to be on how can we fix bad software. I think there's a lot of approaches people have tried to take. The one that I focus most on is fault injection, but I'm going to try to talk about some of the others as well. Um, the first thing I think that will help fix bad software is better compilers and languages. And I do think that Microsoft's doing a good thing, capital GT, uh, and from that perspective. Uh, failure, failure analysis is very important in fault injection. That's not done very widely, although in academia and in the military, it is done with software systems. It's not typically done with commercial software. Another one is to hold vendors liable, but to be honest, with things like UCDA, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I think what people, what the software vendors would like to do is actually sell you software. Like, imagine this. Pretend like the software salesman is selling you a car. It's like them saying, I'm going to sell you this car, sir, and you're going to believe that this is a perfectly secure and safe vehicle. And by the way, it's illegal for you to open the hood and look inside, and it's also illegal for you to have somebody else come over and look inside for you. You can't kick the tires. Oh, and by the way, if you are driving down the road with it and all the wheels fall off and you get in an accident, you can't hold us liable. But you can come buy the next version of our car where we have that, that problem fixed. Security testing is a different methodology than anybody's ever used in QA before. The first and foremost rule of security testing is that you have to believe the software is going to be deployed in a completely untrusted and hostile environment. Every single transaction you believe is going to be uh, used by the, by the, by the software, flip it, on, flip it on its head and say, what are the 10 other transactions somebody can get in here that I'm not assuming right now? Test for the unexpected and the unknown. It is a software reliability problem, I believe. Security is. So it's like a stool here. Uh, we have functional and performance testing. There's big, uh, expensive tools out there that do this for you. Rational Software, Mercury Interactive. 
They've been in the space for a long time and they can help you with functionality and performance. Does it do A, B, and C? Does it do A, B, and C 10,000 times a second like it's supposed to? Well, security testing is, does it do D, E, and F? Now, people do some security testing today on software. Attack and pen is a common way, and I think it's very ad hoc in nature. It's very incomplete. Um, typically, it's for political reasons to guarantee a budget or something like that. So you find a couple of problems and what probably are hundreds of problems, and that's enough. Paste it in the back of a report, show that somebody dumped the database, and boom, you're done. Attack and pen is not a very complete or accurate way to find security bugs. Furthermore, it's typically applied to production environments, not done in development, where the cost of fixing bugs is far less. Source code review is another method. Nobody in the software vendors uh, typically have the skills to do this very well, and if you outsource it, it's very expensive. Um, and it doesn't address the operational environment in which the source code's gonna be placed, but it is, it is a very effective method. I think there was a talk earlier today, or yesterday, I can't remember, uh, that was talking about different tricks. Um, a lot of people in the underground community use uh, source code review to find, you know, in open source at least, uh, find problems that, you know, they publish on bug track and whatnot. Network scanning, that's a completely ridiculous way to treat security. Network scanning um, is basically reactive in nature. It can only look for problems that you already know about, which means the hackers in Germany have already been using it for six months. Fault injection is the space I've been, I've been focusing in to find new vulnerabilities before they go out. And then full disclosure is obviously another way, but again, it's reactive in nature. You have to wait for someone to tell you on bug track that there's a problem in the given software. Um, there's different ways to do fault injection, and I'm gonna focus uh, probably more on fault injection for the rest of the talk. Um, one way to do fault injection is to actually instrument the source code. And there's tools out there that do that. Uh, they actually change the source code. You recompile the source into a new executable, and it will do things like change uh, you know, variables, change the way the paths of the code work, in an effort to see how it fails. This is good because you can then see how, if the binary got completely foobarred by some sunspots from outer space, what would happen to the rest of the air aircraft control system around it, you know, if it gave bad output? Another way is binary instrumentation. I'm much more fond of that because I don't like changing the source code. I think changing the source code kind of defeats the purpose of testing the original product itself. Uh, binary instrumentation just use, uses tricks like call hooking, system call hooking, uh, mutating memory structures and whatnot, uh, debugging APIs, uh, using a test harness. Uh, network testing, uh, network-based input is another way, which is, which is what um, Spike does, i6, uh, Hailstorm, the product that I sell these things change uh, the network-based input. This is kind of interesting because that's kind of how an attacker would usually get into the system is via the network. So it's kind of applicable to security in that, in that way. And CHAM works that way as well, sorry. Um, black box, uh, the good things about black box is that it's easy to automate and it's really easy to find low-hanging fruit. Um, the bad thing about black box is it's not gonna find architectural errors and some of the more obscure bugs in the code are probably better suited for a static analysis to locate, but there's some really good tools out there. Uh, University of Finland, or some university in Finland, I don't remember who exactly, built Protos. Protos found the ASN1 encoding bug in uh, SNMP. There's Spike, uh, which Dave Itell presented on earlier today. i6 is a really cool to tool for doing TCP IP malformations, and it's been very effective at wedging various routers and stuff and of course, uh, Hailstorm, which I'll show you actually in a while. Now, this is a, a spike script that Dave sent me a little while ago. This is a zero-day exploit on Microsoft SQL that I believe he just released. Um, this is a string, there's a packet going into SQL. He sees that there's this string in there, this Microsoft SQL server is identifying itself, and in the spike script, you can see that he's actually modeling the protocol here, and then he's changing this string to be a buffer overflow, and pretty soon, and this is actually the event log, entry that popped up on my machine when I ran it and it caused an access violation. It's probably exploitable. At the very least, it shuts down the system. Here's David Litchfield's recent uh, publishing. Uh, as soon as I saw that come out, I went to Hailstorm, this is actually a screenshot of Hailstorm, and uh, modeled that attack in about five seconds. Um, here's the buffer injection, here's the little lead byte in the UDP payload, and then there's some ASCII sequence number after that, which is part of some kind of session ID or something. Uh, very easy to reproduce and deadly. Here's some screenshots of various pieces of software that I've managed to crash with Hailstorm in my lab over the past month. Um, everything from a Dr. Watson file, which tells me the line of code that it faulted on, um, our ever famous C000005 access violation that we like to see. Here's, um, this is Purify, Rational Purify, telling me about some heap corruption. And one of the funniest ones I got was, the system may be under attack. 
White box testing is another approach, and that's what you do when you have the source code or you use IDA, IDA to reverse assemble or uh, reverse compile the source code. It's more expensive in terms of time, especially in an outsourcing, it's typically going to be more expensive, but it's, it is very thorough. Here's an example of me uh, reverse engineering a really interesting call. I saw the name of this API call, um, canonicalize URI to path, and I just knew I had to check it out. I was trying to find a relative path traversal bug. This is a Solaris binary that I'm reversing here. I can't tell you what platform it is in, but um, I can tell you that after looking at it for a great deal of time, I found you could not actually exploit it. It is a different way to do it. Um, as you can see, it's a very manual process here. I'm, I'm actually hand coding in comments and stuff as I go through. What I think is the next stage for this kind of technology is a fusion between white box and black box. Black box, again, is good for generating input, but without the white box and static analysis, you can't get all the, the um, you can't get the perspective on the context in which the data you're sending is being used. There's a really good tools out there to help you with gray box, but they are manual in nature. Uh, Soft ice is really good because it has automatable breakpoints. I can set a breakpoint on a, on a particular place in code and then write a regular expression that says, only break if the EAX register points to the following string and then I can track my input to the system. It's really cool. GDB has similar features. Um, I IDA, if you haven't been introduced to it and you're interested in learning more about this kind of stuff, it's not very expensive. Get one of your, in your Brainiacs or yourself and buy one in your company and start playing around with it. Um, Hailstorm is another tool which I'll, I'll do a screenshot on shortly. Instrumentation helps a lot in Graybox. Purify is incredible. I love Purify because it can help me find heap corruption all over the place. One of the things, if you're not using instrumentation and you're doing black box testing, you have to wait for the thing to pop. In other words, you wait for the ever famous segmentation violation to occur. But if you're using something like Rational, you can actually see the memory corruption that starts to lead up to a failure. And that's actually better because sometimes the failure doesn't occur for quite a while. Call hooks, code coverage is another way. If you want to know how effective your, your black box injection is, you should run a coverage tool and get numbers. Um, Get the numbers based on all the canonicalization routines, all the filter routines, everything's handling user supplied input, anything's handling protocol parsing. Um, this is my contribution to, to SQL zero day fest at Black Hat. Um, this is me running Purify here, and you can see there's a heap corruption event. That's, that's this, it says uh, PAR, okay, right there. And here's Hailstorm, I'm running some input to it, and there's actually SQL Server running in the background and I found a particular set of input that crashes it dead every time. Actually, I think I can show it to you. This is Hailstorm here. It's a very simple input. This is a TCP session to port 1433. There's two null bytes followed by a 16-bit sequence number, so it's actually gonna send 65,000 packets starting from zero to 65535, and then followed by 40 bytes of random data goes anywhere from zero to 255, so it's covering the whole range of possible values for each byte. This knocks it down dead. It only takes about four or five seconds. And of course, using Purify, this is an interesting thing here, it actually gives me the address at which the heap corruption is occurring, so if I was at Microsoft and a developer, I could use that information to go cross-reference the actual line of source code that's causing problem, or in the region of logic that's causing problems. Okay, so input path tracing is a really important thing for Graybox. You want to try to track your input. Um, I think that Halvar's talk talked a little bit about this too, but to say, I want to track from the user supplied input, which is completely untrusted, all the way to the trusted API call over here that is you know, doing a file system operation or a database operation. So I talked about soft ice. You can set those conditional breakpoints with regex. That's a very good way to do it. I recently was introduced to Trust, which is a Solaris tool for tracking uh, API calls. Um, I have some screenshots here of some other solutions as well. My trick, uh, do what I call boron tagging. Um, this is actually um, GDB under Solaris, and I'm setting in a test string, and you can see that's my boron tag test string, and uh, I see it get it used. So and here's, here's the API call, um, and it's actually kind of a funny name, is URI evil? <laughs> so it must have been there to prevent like an attack of some kind, and uh, I can see that my test string is here, and so I've set a little thing to watch for that. So boron tagging is an effective way to track input. Unfortunately, there, as far as I know, there aren't really any automated tools to do it for you currently. Now, I know people are working on stuff like that. Here's a truss. This is truss. Truss is actually running against uh, the target, and I can see multiple calls to stir copy occurring. 
And what I do is I watch trust and then I do some input. And if I see a store copy go by, I'm going to go look at the code that just did that because I just ran a transaction. That store copy just happened. It's not coincidence. So I think, okay, there might be something I can do there for a buffer overflow. You could also do that for file system calls and other things. Under Win32, there are also options. This is API Spy32, which is pretty cool, um, and it's free. And so I just have a screenshot of that. This is Microsoft SQL Server making millions of calls to Elster copy in a row. Now, if I can just go in here and look at these, these actual arguments to the calls and figure out, oh, is that a registry key? Is that a file? Oh, it's a registry key. Okay, let me go make the registry key really big and see what happens. That's a black box approach to it. Or I can stick it in IDA and go find that line of code that made that call and see if it's actually doing, uh, using store copy properly. So one of my assumptions when I'm thinking about ripping apart software is that if there's code in the software to do it, my assumption is it's possible to do. Now that's obviously not 100% true, but it's a good way to work. Assume your filter code will fail. Assume that the, the input to the API call in question will be completely controlled by the user. What can they get away with? Every single DLL in the system has code that's going to be in the process space that can do stuff. Um, there's, static analysis won't solve this problem. You have to load the program and actually run it. I don't know if you know this, but if you run PGP desktop, PGP puts a DLL in every single process space. All kinds of weird stuff like that occur. There's a really cool to tool on sysin sysinternals.com called uh, Process Explorer, I think. And it does some really cool things. It shows you all the resources, all the DLLs, and everything that's loaded. So. Um, Eventually, I think the operating system is the last line of defense and your process permissions and access control is all you've got. Um, one of the things I think is a cool approach, if you're going to do it this way, is to find some vulnerable, some, some kinds of a API calls that are really easy to get wrong. Uh, set security descriptor DACL is one of them. And so here I have a little Perl script that I wrote that's doing a dump bin slash imports on every single DLL on my system and piping that through a regex and just telling me every single uh, DLL on my system is currently using that call somewhere. I could follow this up by an automated IDA script that goes and checks to see if the third parameter is null, which would be rather interesting. Um, okay, so when you're going through the code and you're looking for problems, uh, I'm just going to talk a little, I got a couple slides on what, what you should look at. Obviously, user input's the key. Um, anything that the user inputs to the system that gets used somewhere that's trusted, that's, that's a, the eventual goal. goal. So uh, authentication calls, um, you know, file system calls, database, anything like a command shell. This is all old hat to anybody who's been doing it for a while. Um, remote capabilities, this is an interesting uh, area of failure. I might log in with a uh, user ID, and then I can also log in with user ID of backslash backslash my machine name or some IP address backslash username or slash domain or domain slash username. If somebody's not watching this stuff, sometimes they'll paste directly into the target API uh, something that you, you supply on the outside, and you can do this kind of remote kind of proxy to tack on the internal network. Um, data source names for databases is another area this happens a lot. They'll paste the server name or something in when they don't realize that the server name is controlled by the host field from the header of the HTTP request. Uh, authentication calls are also an interesting place to look. Uh, response aggregation is an area like, uh, response aggregation is if I can do username and then I get an error or username and the bad password and it gets me a different error than username and, uh, or bad username and you know, forget the password at that point. That's a response aggregation. That's one place to look in code for vulnerabilities. No lockout, I can do a brute force for as long as I want. Failed logging, uh, if I can make a request and it doesn't get logged, like I don't wanna you know, attack your Telnet or your SSH port, but I could attack your POT3 port all day long and it would be going against the same authentication database, then that's a problem. Um, or specifying remote demand or target. In terms of failed logging, I think this is kind of a funny example of that. These two requests are 100% equivalent under IIS and Apache, but they don't look equivalent to us. But they're exactly the same. Um, this would possibly defeat an uh, IDS system, or if it gets logged and you can get certain control characters in there, you can make the logging fail so it doesn't notice that you just made this request. Um, controlling the file system is an obvious target. We've all seen the dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash shit all day long, so we know about that. Um, can you create files in target directory? That's one that I've seen a lot coming out recently where someone figures out how to create a file in a directory and they name it something.asp and they've just created this huge oblique method of getting all this code to run for them. And then of course remote path names is another area. We talked about buffer rolls and execution flaws. Architecture flaws, lack of randomness in the keys is a good place to look. No authentication, as ridiculous as it sounds, you can still find all kinds of places all over the internet where you can just grab stuff you're not supposed to be able to get. Nobody cares or seems to care about authenticating you. Um, compartments. Here's an interesting example of a bug related to compartmentalization. Internet Information Server 
a while back had this bug where it was using the same buffer in memory for cryptid text and clear text. And if you send the requests to the server fast enough, you could cause it to hiccup about one out of a thousand times it would send you the clear text instead of the crypto text. And then you could, of course, do a crypto analysis at that point. So compartmentalization, if you see that the, the programmer's not using any kind of concepts like that, then, then that's, that's gonna get you in. Race conditions. All right, so I've kind of gone through that. So how do we take control of the problem? I'm almost done with my talk here. Um, your arm, we, we talked about why, what is bad software and the kinds of damages that can be associated. Everything from, you know, Microsoft Word's not working right for me to um, millions of dollars in damages to someone lose their life. Um, we talked about some of the solutions or kind of how we got to have bad software and then some of the solutions that we could use to try to help make software better if we're analyzing it. Um, how do we take control of it? Well, I think you should test before you buy. Try, try and buy. Force vendors into standoffs. If you're all from, if you, let's say you're a pharmaceutical, create a shared lab. Get together with all your other pharmaceutical buddies and create a shared lab where you do some extensive testing on it. And actually put an acceptance criteria in place. Say things like, 15 years is too long. You don't get to have buffer overflows anymore. We get to remove that from your deck of cards now. If they have a buffer overflow, say no. We're going to go to the other, the other product. If chances are, if you do that, though, you're going to find buffer overflows in every product that you're looking at, so it's not going to be a panacea. The, the fact is, is if you know about vulnerabilities in the vendor's software, then you have a position of strength in, in, in regards to them, especially if you have buying power. If you need any examples of this, just look at trustworthy computing. The only reason Microsoft cares is because the Gartner report came out and people stopped buying their products for a while in the financial sector and started to hit their bottom line and they, they saw it. It was hitting their bottom line and costing them money and it is about money, so they decided to make the memo and change how Microsoft was addressing the problem. I think it's a good thing, but I think it's an ex excellent example of how nobody cares unless it costs them money. If you can't get together and create a shared testing lab or you don't have the capability in-house, ask the vendor to produce a technical credible audit. I mean, it's not as good. I mean, you have to be an outside firm. The liability thing, I, I honestly, I, I really don't know. You can tell me if you think it'll ever work out, but will the software vendor ever be held liable for the damages of someone breaking into my website? It's, uh, it's your decision. I mean, it's your software. You're buying it. And I think you have the right to have reliable software, and I think security is part of that. I think security is part of the reliable software. And I think that today, uh, security knowledge is widespread enough that there's no excuse about, oh, we don't know about security anymore. And uh, the tools are out there. There's a lot of really good people working on the problem all over the place. A lot of the stuff is free. There's no excuse. You have the capability now to take control of the problem, and that's what I think you should do. Oh, and they made me throw this slide in really quick. So uh, Hailstorm is the product I sell, and I was just showing you a, a screenshot of that earlier. Um, we sell it for 30 grand a pop. It's very expensive, but um, we have this special going right now, so if you want to check it out, um, it's like 57.50 for a restricted IP range. We normally don't sit, set restricted IP ranges on our, our license keys because it's kind of defeating the purpose of doing like algorithmic injection if you can't you know, change your IP address in every packet and things like that. But for this special, if you want to buy it, you can for this low price of 57.50. Okay, pimping is over. Thank you for your time. Um, have fun in Vegas. If there's any questions. Yes, sir. The question was, can we try before we buy? Yeah. I encourage it. Um, I, I'll tell you this, though. Hailstorm's a complicated product. So if you're going to try it, put it in the hands of someone in the organization who's pretty technical, probably understands network protocols. Nobody else? Okay, thanks guys.